Hello there, um, and welcome to this discussion where myself and two other speakers will be discussing our thoughts and advice about remembering those who have died. My name is Andy Langford, and I'm the Clinical Director for Cruise Bereavement Care. Now, Cruise Bereavement Care is the largest bereavement charity in the UK, and we provide support, advice, and information to anyone who's struggling with grief. I've been with Cruise for over five years, but I've been in the voluntary sector for over 20 years, including 17, particularly in the area of bereavement. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by two fantastic guests, the very Reverend David Ison, uh, Dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, and David Gompertz, founder of the Yellow Hearts Campaign. Uh, so let's start with some introductions. So David Ison, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great, thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, the Dean of St. Paul's, which is that big place in London with the dome on top. Um, I've never always been there. I, I've been a priest for over 40 years now. I've worked in five different parish churches and cathedrals uh, in Devon, West Midlands, West Yorkshire and London. Um, and I've been involved with hundreds of families engaged with bereavement and been alongside them and helped with appropriate services and memorials over the years. So I know how important this all is, that we all encounter loss and bereavement and we all need help and support in it. Thank you so much, David. Um, and it is important to remember, isn't it, that the, the experience of bereavement is a, a universal thing. We'll, we'll all experience bereavement at some point and, um, and those close to us will experience it too. So thank you. Um, moving on to David Gompertz now, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Uh, my wife and I were retired and she was a great horticulturalist and she knew the names of every plant in the garden, nearly everybody else's garden, and she gradually lost them and she got dementia. And we moved up to be near my son in the Midlands. Uh, eventually she moved into a home and then she died in April from COVID-19. Mm. Uh, I was upset, I was irritated. I used to watch the government briefing each day saying how many people had died and how the government minister's heart went out to people who'd lost people. And I've worked with government and this was just a script and I got angry and I thought we need to illustrate to people how many people are dying and the, how it spread across the country. And with my granddaughter, and I can talk about it later, we ended up with the idea of sitting uh, putting yellow hearts in our windows to show that we'd lost somebody from COVID. And my granddaughter, two granddaughters, put it on Facebook and we've been going ever since. Oh, David, thank you so much for sharing uh, your story. I, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear your loss, but thank you so much for, for, for bringing your experience here. Thank you. Really do appreciate that. Thank you both so much for those poignant introductions. Um, now, now, just to, for us to, to start on the, on, the, um, on the discussion here, um, I'll, I'll go into a bit of context first. So the coronavirus pandemic has made it particularly difficult um, for people when they're grieving now, um, however they've been bereaved. Uh, we're in the middle of a second wave or second spike of the pandemic. And as, as, as ever, death tolls are rising, infection rates are rising. Um, and one of the many things that has been cruelly taken away from people this year is the chance to hold tributes. Um, things like memorials, um, funerals, uh, other celebrations of life and rituals in the way that they would want. Um, however, the pandemic has also tri triggered difficult feelings for those who were bereaved prior to the pandemic, with death and dying being made a constant part of everyday life. Uh, it, it's for these reasons that today's discussion will centre around how to remember those who have died and how to keep those memories alive and, and remember that, that every life has a meaning which is, which is so, so important and so cherished. Now at Cruise, we know how important it can be for people to remember the person who has died. It can be a source of comfort and we can, we, we have, as coping, we can have that as coping mechanisms. Um, we can absolutely recommend that people talk to other people about the person who's died and about their memories and what, what their life has meant for them. It can be painful, but it can also be a chance to provide great comfort and great support and remember the good times as well as the difficult times. Um, now, David I, um, 
do, would you like to take a, a few minutes just to talk through um, from St Paul's perspective um, what the um, what the Remember Me project is doing? At St Paul's we're a place of remembrance and we have memorial services and so on um, but of course we couldn't do that during the pandemic during lockdown um, and I was talking in early April with our Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally, who before she was ordained, she was a nurse. And so she knows too about the pain of bereavement and understanding of grief and loss. And we were talking during the pandemic about what, what can we do, how distressing it is for people who can't get together with their friends and family, can't be with their loved ones in their final hours, can't grieve or remember and affirm their love for the person who's died in the way that they're used to. How can we help them? Um, as a church, we, we couldn't do services, we couldn't bring people together in that way. Uh, but we could do something online, we thought, to help people come together to remember and be able to express their love for those they'd lost because of the virus. So that's how the Remember Me project and website was born, a virtual memorial site on the internet to help people mark the lives of those who died because of the pandemic in the UK, whether directly or indirectly. And when we started talking about this with others, people were really enthusiastic. They got the vision and understanding. They came on board. Uh, we found people who helped us to set up a website within a few weeks. It's had a really positive response from the people who've heard about it. And thousands of names have been put onto the site since then. And it's for people of all faiths or no faith uh, from all parts of the UK. And it's been a really moving experience to see and pray for those who've died and for their families. Thank you so why, much. Oh, well, sorry, I was just going to go on to think about, well, you know, what, how does it help? You know, what, what, why are we doing this? Well, I mean, there are two particular things I think I want to point to. One is every person who dies needs to have their worth acknowledged. Every person matters. Their life matters to others. They have a positive impact on the world. And, and those around them, they're loved and they're missed, not only by their immediate family, but by by the wider society, we, we know what that's like. Um, and because we couldn't express that in the pandemic, putting somebody's name and photo and a short message onto the website assures a family that that person is not forgotten, that their life matters, that they have a place not only in the hearts of those who love them, but also in the hearts of the community, the community as well. Um, one of my predecessors said 400 years ago, a guy called John Dunn, who was Dean of St Paul's, that everyone's death diminishes me as well, because we're all connected with one another. And that's a really important thing that we wanted to express by doing this. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate that. And the, the also the context historically is important. And it, it sounds like there's been so much accomplished in such a short space of time. Yeah, I mean, we, we were amazed that, well, we, we couldn't have done it. I mean, we found some some amazing philanthropists and others who, who pitched in to do it and people understood how computers worked and how to set up websites and so on. Um, and, and one of the, the key things, I guess, for us is the idea that if this is on the web and the web is a kind of intangible thing. And one of the things you, you miss actually is the sense of, you know, when somebody dies, the sense of you know, that, 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 that touch, that feeling. So we thought it was important to have something which was rooted in a real place, which is why we're doing it from St Paul's. And we are working towards the idea of having a physical memorial in due course that people can come and visit. So, so people know that this is held by a, a living institution, that, that, that you know, we, we care about this. We pray for the people who go on our website. We, we read the, the, what they put up there. Um, so that people feel that you know, this is something which is real because it is real. Mm. Yes, it's real and tangible on so many levels, isn't yeah. it? Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for that explanation. Um, it'd be great if we could turn to, to you, David G, and just get your perspective. Well, uh, I had had nothing to do with social media because I'm old and I don't understand these things. And my two granddaughters said they put up a Yellow Hearts Facebook page. And uh, it's rather complementary to the St. Paul's one, is that we are much more free flowing and people can put in poetry, music, videos, comments, 
and people can talk backwards and forwards to each other. And they're regular contributors, they're occasional contributors, and people can express their pain in a whole different variety of ways. Uh, I read through every day, and I'm just amazed. Uh, I've learned about grief in a way that you professionals know, and I didn't know before. Um, and uh, it's clear that we have helped people because occasionally we get messages saying, thank you for letting me uh, join your group. Uh, I was in pieces until somebody pointed me towards you and it gave me a feeling of being part of a community that could help me. And so um, we've got something going. We've got 6,500 members. Uh, let's hope we've uh, helped a good proportion of those on the way and they can come back to us again and again. But we are just amateurs in the business uh, and people like St Paul's and Cruz uh, are going to be here much longer than we are. My two granddaughters are both at university. I'm running to the end of my time here. And uh, if uh, we can end up having a system that is uh, permanently available for people to talk yeah, I, I don't want to say, you know, I, I think what David and the Yellow Hearts campaign has done is fantastic um, because it does provide a way for people to come together in community, particularly people who are on their own um, or find it difficult to find others who share their experience. Um, Can I say one other thing about the Yellow Hearts group? Um, we made a decision fairly early on. It should be kind and helpful and gentle. And as the... Uh, even people know people go through an angry phase and they're justifiably angry because things have been handed, handled very badly as a country and we didn't want that anger in our group there are other groups like covid families for justice where the anger can be expressed and so we've tried to keep ourselves as a supportive and loving group rather than people all uh, sharing their anger mm. Thank you. Thank you so, so much both, um, to both of you. One of the things that, um, that, that really shines out for me, um, David G, when you were describing your accounts, is the importance of community and people connecting, um, which, which is so vital, so vital at this time particularly, I think. Um, so thank you. I mean, um, at, at Cruise, we know one of the things that people really struggle with um, one of the things that, that can be really daunting for people is the things like anniversaries. Um, and when most pe when people might experience sort of particularly first incidences of something like the first birthday uh, or a first Christmas, and obviously Christmas is just around the corner here. Um, and and I'll, I'll come to David I first and then to David G. Um, so David I, what's your advice on getting through these particularly difficult periods of the year? I guess um, from my own experience and from observing others, um, and one thing that helps is if you're ready for it, if, if you know that it's going to be like that. Um, and being, you know, when, when you're reminded that this is the first time that you've gone through this without that particular person in your life, if you're prepared for that, it helps. It can help, I think, to plan in advance what you might do. Um, as a vicar, you might expect me to say this, but I really do think that praying helps. And even if you don't have much of a faith, you can still stop and be still and remember the life and the love of that special person and honour their memory in the way that we do corporately on Remembrance Day right across the country. And you may find it helpful to light a candle on those difficult first days or to have a ritual that you do, like going to visit a particular place or looking at particular pictures. And of course, if you can, talking with other people on those days who remember the person you love does bring the memory of their presence closer to you. Um, it may bring tears too, but that kind of emotional release is something we all need when we're coping with the depth of loss. Mm, absolutely. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate those thoughts. Um, David G, what would you like to add? Not a lot. I went through my wife's birthday We've been through uh, uh, what would have been our diamond wedding uh, without her here. Uh, it, to me, the important days don't matter in a sense. That's a, a strange thing to say. A lot of people 
were saying on Yellow Heart, it's exactly six months to a day since my loved one died. And somebody said to me, why is that six months important? Well, it obviously was to them. And I'm not here to judge what people feel important and how they should react to it. I mean, uh, to me, the, 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 these particular anniversaries didn't cause extra sadness. Uh, the loneliness is a daily basis. Uh, I've got a problem with so-and-so. I'd discuss it with Sheila. Well, she ain't here. So, you know, it, it, uh, the big days, uh, it's the empty days that matter than the big days. Mm. So, the, so the loneliness is, is something that, that echoes a lot. Yeah. The other thing I would like to say is um, I have a cousin whose wife died uh, from dementia uh, a, a few a couple of months ago. That was after Sheila. She didn't have COVID. It seems fairly obvious to me that although COVID has given us a hook to hang everything on, mm. uh, it's just a part of uh, the general business of bereavement. The problem with COVID is uh, that the families who have bereaved, so many, so many are suffering because they couldn't say goodbye. Mm. So we've got an extra di dimension of pain. Yes, and it's where, what we find within crews as well is that we often hear people saying that those those services, those rituals, those ways of remembering people are disrupted. Um, and also that often folk can't be together with each other, uh, which matters so much. Um, so, so, so David G, David I, thank you so much. That's really, really helpful advice. Um, and certainly what, what, what I'm hearing you saying amongst many things is that there are, there are some things that often help people around sort of structures and systems and, and, and rituals and time we can take, whether it's just to pray or to reflect, remember the person who, who's, who means so much to us. Um, and also that each experience of bereavement is different. Each is differently. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and so, so one of the things that, um, that we find is, unfortunately, one thing that is often the most difficult is simply accepting um, that these occasions will be difficult, that it's anniversaries that are hard. Um, and at Cruise, we'd like to advise that spending time, as you, as, as you said there, David and I, um, being prepared and in advance to think about what you might need and what might help to cope is really important. Um, now, some people do try to avoid the pain of certain events by making sure that they're away from people and places which might bring about or bring to the fore those sort of sad thoughts and memories. Um, you know, for those listening or those watching, you may feel it's important to mark a day in a special way uh, for you um, and for the person who's died and for those, for, for other people who are mourning too. And it's important um, is that you, you, you prepare for that and have, and that there's some special private meaning behind that. Or if it's, if it's private to you, it might actually be private to a small group and it's a meaning that you share with each other. Um, some people find it comforting to take part in religious and cultural practices, uh, which help individuals and groups remember the person who's died and also celebrate their lives and their work and their memory. And it's also an opportunity to come together, isn't it? Um, others find that, they, find that they prefer something that's more individual and more personal. Uh, and, and others would, would come to us and say they prepare, prefer to do nothing uh, and, and at all times try and maintain uh, normal routine life. Or, or, or sometimes they would find that distraction helps. Um, but the uncertainty and anxiety surrounding death may lead to fixed ideas and thinking. But it's important to remember that people remember and, and forget the dead in their own ways. Sometimes that does happen. Um, and what bereaved people um, can often find is that, is that certainly what people are telling us is that people grieve in different ways. And sometimes that's interpreted as not caring or, or perhaps being too distracted with grief. But, but equally, what we need to remember, as I say, is that, is that people are all grieving in different ways and grieving in different ways at different times. Um, and as, as time passes, anniversaries and reminders 
can help us begin to focus on happy memories and the good times and also remember the person who's died. Uh, rightly so is sad. Right. So is sad. Um, now, uh, we went out to our audience on social media for suggestions for questions. And one that seemed popular was around keeping someone's memory alive. And in particular, for um, suggestions for remembering the person's voice. Um, I'll come to David I first and then to David G. Uh, David I, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I, I guess I'd agree with you in, in that there's no right or wrong about these things. It's whatever somebody finds helpful. Um, and some people like to listen, other people like to see. So it's about pictures or films or videos. Um, they can all be helpful. Um, images, sights, sounds, and often smells, of course, can trigger our memories as well. Um, I know people who will turn the clothes, some clothes into a blanket or whatever, and kind of keepsake, so, so they've got something to hold that the person used or made uh, in some way can help them be present in a sense, uh, reading a letter. Um, so, so having the sound of a voice, I, I guess part of that is because of the fear of forgetting. And it's you know, one of the things, again, in experience in bereavement is people can feel they're forgetting the person that they've loved. And you know, they've, they've gone a few hours, they've not thought about them, or they can't remember what they sound like, what they look like. And, and that tends to come and go. Um, and sometimes people are afraid they've lost it forever. Generally, that's, that's not the case. It will come and go. Um, but but it, it's, it's hard to, to hold on. And I think one of the key things for me is not only about having things that help individuals remember, but also doing that together. Because what we, what we lose is the relationship we've had with someone. And often it's when we're in company with other people and we're talking about the person. And, and as you say, the, the good things, the, the things that we valued about them, what, what, what made us laugh, their quirks, things that were odd about, you know, all those things help us to recall their presence in relationship with us and with others with other people who were touched by the effects that this person that we loved had upon them, whether it's members of our family or friends or the wider community. Um, and to some extent, the, the person that we love lives on in the effect that they have in us and the effect on other people. So doing things together, if you can, I think is also a helpful way. Mm. Thanks so much, David Ison. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, David G, if we can turn to you for your thoughts, please. Well, they're just personal. I've got photos in uh, most of the rooms and I've been through all the holiday photos and yanked out uh, a happy one from Sheila from each holiday we went on and put it together in a compilation album. So it's there and uh, I can see uh, from dark haired to grey haired to dyed haired and back to white haired and uh, that's the story of our lives and we got on together. Oh lovely. Thanks so much. That's a real practical way of of remembering isn't it engaging with those memories really bringing them to life i mean one of the things oh sorry there david well i was just going to say i mean sometimes you know the, the thing about about the voice sometimes is we don't think about that and so i'm actually i was just thinking you know in terms of voice recordings i'd have very little about you know, the people I remember, because voice hasn't been something which that, that we've tended to capture. Um, and, and it might be helpful to, to think about that in advance too, uh, with someone if you love if they're ill, is to get them to make a recording, um, if that's going to be something which is valuable for you and your family. Uh, and also to think, you know, if you have got grandchildren or other relatives, something that they too can listen to. Um, uh, as a way of helping them get back in touch with the person, sometimes a person they hardly knew, um, but someone who can give them a message while they're still able to. Mm. With Sheila being very much a gardener, horticulturalist, and having moved to a new house, I'm trying to plant up the beds there in the way that she would have done. But quite a, pe a lot of people on Yellow Hearts are planting roses, trees, little gardens up. So people are making the sort of mini St Paul's memorial which will last in their own homes. Yeah. Mm. That's really poignant, isn't it? I mean, often we, um, you know, we find at crews people coming to us and being concerned that in that in some way they're supposed to, you know, they've been told to get over it, or they've been told to somehow 
um, even forget the person who's died, which which sounds completely contrary to the, the whole experience of their lives when they've um, spent so much time with the person who's meant so much to them. But um, one of the things we, we often find ourselves talking about is how even though someone dies, we don't stop relating to them. We don't stop the relationship. It changes, but we, we relate to the memories of, of the person who's died. And we also relate to everything that they've literally planted in us um, to make us who we are today. Um, so I think sometimes, sometimes people are afraid of emotion um, or afraid of triggering it in somebody else. Uh, and actually, you, you have to go through those feelings of, of loss and pain, uh, as well as also laughter and joy. I mean, it's all tied up together. And mm -hmm. so not being afraid when somebody cries or to be able to cry yourself, um, that, that's a gift that you can give to someone else who's grieving um, because it, it, it helps you get through. And what we do is we learn to live with it. We don't forget. We, we learn to live with the loss. Um, but going through the pain is a necessary part of being able to do that. We, we, we can't avoid it, uh, but we can help one another bear it. Mm, absolutely. Thanks so much. And I add something. Uh, when I was young, and it was after, just after the war, uh, and I don't know if it was related to that, people wore black armbands when they were in mourning. Mm. Now it's only footballers that seem to do that. And uh, I was uh, wondering at the back of my mind, as if something like the yellow heart, this side, sorry, uh, spread around, there might be a symbol which people would wear, which would be small and unobtrusive, say, you know, somebody in our family is gone. Mm. Absolutely. I think it would also reflect the, the universality of bereavement. Yeah. Um, that we, we'll all experience the loss of someone close. If we haven't already, we will. Um, and that it, it matters that you're not, you might feel alone, but you're not alone. Thank, thank you so much. Um, what, what I also want to turn to is, is, is thinking about the current context, because as we know now, the restrictions this year have meant that many people have been unable to pay tribute to those who they love who've died, um, or, or, or as we've actually referred to before, to plan events such as memorials and funerals. Um, and this can be particularly difficult because people, uh, because often people see themselves, see events like this as a chance to say goodbye. Um, other question uh, we had from an audience, from the audience was how to remember someone when you've been, when you, we've been told that you can't hold a memorial uh, or, or you can't see the rest of the family for whatever reason. Um, now, David G, obviously the Yellow Hearts campaign has been a wonderful way for pe people to pay tribute to loved ones for those who've died. Um, what response have you had uh, to it in terms of how it's helped people to remember loved ones? Um, and also, uh, what would your advice be to anyone who has found themselves in a position of being unable to hold a memorial uh, or to see family? Really, I, I can't. I haven't got that much experience. My experience goes back April and that's all you're a professional you two um, I, I don't know everybody's got to find their way through this we, with professional help but uh, there are things you could do for memorials whether it, as I say planting a tree or uh, uh, wearing something or uh, I, I've just got no idea how to handle it I uh, we've handled it in the way that seemed appropriate to our family mm. But I think that's really precious to know, isn't it? It's, it's a way that seemed appropriate to you and your family. But it's also something, David, which you know, lots, thousands of other people have felt was appropriate for them. And, and that's a particular gift that you and Sheila have been able to give them. Um, but putting something onto the website, being able to talk to other people about it, uh, has been a way that people have found to have community and remembrance in a time when it's been so difficult to do that. And I think that's wonderful. Mm. We, we live in a social media uh, environment now, not one I feel totally comfortable in. But obviously, a lot of people, it's a central part of their lives. And so it was inevitable 
uh, that uh, this morning and um, reaction to something like COVID would go on to the social media and we would just uh, the channel when it happened. Mm. No, absolutely. And it's it's about, it seems to me, it's about using those ways that we can connect. Um, use, using all we have really to be able to connect and to, to remember and to, to create space for that connection. Um, so, so thank you so much. Um, and, and David, I, uh, equally the Remember Me project must have been so helpful for people. Um, what impact have you found uh, that it's had for people struggling to find a way to pay tribute. Um, I I was in the cathedral when we were allowed to be open um, and to have distant services just a few weeks ago. Um, and two ladies came up to light a candle in St Paul's, and one of them said, um, oh, wh "Where's the book?" And I said, "Well, it's at the moment. It's just on the internet. Although we're hoping to do a memorial." And um, she said, "Oh, you know, my my sister's husband." has died of COVID and we got talking and the widow said to me, well, you know, th this means such a lot to us to be able to come here. She said, my great, 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 great grandfather was Christopher Wren, who was the architect who built St. Paul's. Wow. Um, and so, I, you know, there's a real sense of connection there. And, and that sense of connection is something which other people feel and to built on. But one of the ideas behind the, the Remember Me Memorial is to say, look, this is a new way of doing memorial. St Paul's mm -hmm. has got hundreds of memorials to, to the great and the good, mostly white men, of course, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, who died in battles and wars and so on. Um, actually, th this is a memorial to simply anyone and everyone who's gone through this pandemic and died as a result. Um, you know, it's a very democratic memorial and we can have thousands of people who are remembered and are part of this memorial. Um, and I think it's, it's it, for me, it's, it's not just about remembering those who've died, it's remembering the suffering of those who've lost the people they love and remembering the suffering of all of us. I mean, it's been traumatic for everyone in the country. And so to have a memorial which says, you know, everyone's suffering is recognized in some way. And, and we hold that at St. Paul's as a community. We've been around for 1400 years. We hope to be around for hundreds of years more. And we want to hold that memory going forward in the way that we remember the past. So take this into the future. And, and it gives people a sense of being rooted and noticed and belonging. And that's something we really want to do. Hmm. Thank you, that's really helpful. It What resonates for me, one of the things that does in that is that sense of each person's experience is, is, is unique and individual, but also there can be solidarity um, in experience. There can be togetherness. There can be that connection. Um, so, so thank you so much. Thank you both to, uh, to you both. Um, I would also add some other practical tips, such as creating a memory box um, or setting some time aside to have, to, to have your own private way of saying goodbye uh, or even a memorial at home. Um, as, as, as David G had talked about there, looking at pictures uh, is, is really helpful for some people. Um, even playing some of a person's favorite music, uh, writing a message to them, uh, lighting a candle, uh, or, or following any of your own specific cultural rituals that you find helpful. Uh, it, it's really important to remember that we'll not be under these restrictions forever. And at some future point, you may be able to hold a formal or informal memorial to those who have died. And we're here to speak, um, we're, we are here to speak to it if you need us. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our discussion. Obviously the topics we've discussed have been difficult and may have brought up difficult memories for people. Um, if you find you're struggling with grief and need support, Cruise is here to help. So you can contact our helpline, which is available on 0808 808. 1677. That's 0808 808 1677. And that's free to access. Or you can visit our website, which is www.cruise.org.uk. That's www.cruise.org.uk. Um, and if you want to find out more about the Yellow Hearts campaign, uh, please, please do visit the link. And for more information about the St. Paul's Remember Me project, 
uh, please do visit our tomb. I'd like to say a huge thank you to our two guests, David Gompertz and David Eisen. It's been a really valuable discussion. Thank you so much and goodbye to all. <laughs>